Hello, everybody. So the United States, the citizens of the United States, they are uh, electing their new president, and we are going to take a look who is better on nuclear. Now, I have to add a caveat here because Trump obviously had his own administration. Harris was the vice president in the Biden administration, but it stands to reason that whatever is being put forward as policy right now under the Biden administration gets continued once Harris takes over, if Harris takes over, because obviously the race hasn't been decided yet. It will be decided Tuesday next week. I believe it's November 5th. So, and then it will take however much time it will take for the votes to be counted until we definitively know whether it will be Kamala Harris who wins this election or Donald Trump. So what's going on? The citizens of the United States are about to choose the new president. The difference between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are really small in some states. It's just, you know, we're talking about a couple of thousand and votes difference so we're going to try to answer the question who is better on nuclear and i am going to assume that kamala harris is going to continue most policies of the current administration so a an overview of the nuclear policy approach trump basically what they did was they said well we want to secure energy dominance uh, we want to make sure that the united states doesn't have to buy any energy from other countries we want to be the world leader in in, in nuclear and in, 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 in liquefi liquefied natural gas, all that kind of stuff. And that's basically what their policies were focused on. And they also tried to emphasize the need for streamlining and supporting regulations and rules so that the nuclear industry could flourish and compete globally. Now, the Biden administration had a slightly different approach to nuclear. What they were doing was they 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 primarily saw nuclear as a low carbon energy source which it also which it is and they basically said listen we need we, since we have a lot of nuclear energy in the united states we have you know almost 100 gigawatts of clean nuclear power um it stands to reason that we are going to make this uh, an integral part of our climate focused policies now, if we look at investments in advanced nuclear technology, because the United States obviously has a lot of uh, startups, brilliant people who are developing new reactor concepts, uh, Trump saw this, uh, saw this uh, at least the Trump administration, uh, they saw this potential. So they launched the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, which basically uh, provides funding for demonstration projects of advanced reactors. Think about the Kairos Power, uh, the Kairos Power Project in, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but also think about the Terra Power uh, Project in Wyoming. Now, the Biden administration, what they did was, obviously, this is a good idea. So they continued the ARDP and they said, OK, we're going to make sure that this gets more emphasis, more emphasis, right? So you, you get interesting companies like Oklo, like Terrestrial Power, uh, like Kairos Power, like uh, Terra Power. I mean, they're all power companies. Um with their concepts, trying to make sure that they can actually get a commercial commercially viable reactor concept uh, to market then in the previous year year and a half what you saw was the first next and phoenix programs um this is this is obviously uh, still aligned with this advanced reactor demonstration program but 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 basically branching out a little bit uh, looking for uh, more ways to, you know, make use of small modular reactors, and, and, and especially interesting is the Phoenix uh, Phoenix uh, program in this regard because the Phoenix program looks at existing coal plants and they try to identify coal plants uh, where the coal burning bit can be taken out, and the heat source for that used to be the coal burning bit can be replaced by a high heat. Uh, nuclear reactor so there's a, there's loads of designs out there that that can get up to you know 550 or 600 or 650 degrees and and that's exactly where you want to be if you want to repower um you know the the, the power conversion equipment that is normally attached to a coal boiler 
So that's that's the that's the emphasis, particularly of the Phoenix program. And now this year, this October, uh, what we saw is that the Biden Harris administration rolled out another 900 million package in order to aid uh, the construction of these uh, small modular reactors. Now, this is the news uh, over here. The Biden Harris administration announces 900 million to build and deploy next generation nuclear technologies. Now, I'm guessing that, uh, for instance, the Kairos power. Uh, the Kairos Power uh, project is in here, but I'm also hoping that we are going to get some new names because we have uh, we have X Energy. They are going to deploy their uh, their reactor concept in order to uh, power Amazon's uh, Amazon's data centers in Richland, which is in I believe it's in Washington State. Please forgive me, if I, or is it, yeah, I believe it is in Washington State. In any case, it's in the northwest of the United States. Uh, we have Kairos Power with their demonstration program. We have Terra Power at this moment, but I also hope that uh, Oklo can get some money from that from that from this fund. Uh, Terrestrial Energy might get some uh, get some money from this fund. There's a load of uh, very interesting vendors out there that are doing interesting stuff with this. Over here, you can see the advanced nuclear commercial lift off uh, document. Uh, it outlines a lot of benefits, um, also how to make uh, how to make uh, how to basically. Um, refinance uh, how to think about uh, financing new nuclear differently than what we've done in the past and uh, in that way what you can do is you can actually bring down the capital cost and you can bring down the the levelized cost of electricity and they say okay you can reduce it up to uh, 60 dollars uh, 60 dollars per per megawatt hour whereas uh, at this moment it looks like Vogel 3 and 4 are you know uh, going to deliver power at somewhere between 126 US dollars and 186 US dollars and then there is there is much more going on so uh, support for for existing nuclear plant uh, support for existing nuclear plants the trump administration uh, they they basically focused on a regulatory reform in, in order to make uh, nuclear power plants more viable uh, but they didn't really put any money into the industry in order to keep reactors open whereas the biden administration they basically made a fund of 6 billion uh, U.S. dollars. It was called the Civil Nuclear Credit Program, and this is basically specifically aimed at you know nuclear power plants that need a little bit of extra money in order to make sure that they can survive for the next 10, 20, or maybe even 30 years. And uh, I believe that Diablo Canyon got like 1.1 billion um, from this uh, from this fund in order to make sure that they can stay operational well up into the 2030s so basically diablo canyon is one of those uh, nuclear power plants that is being saved thanks to uh, in part the biden harris administration now the nuclear fuel supply chain security what did the trump admin do uh, they created the nuclear fuel working group to address vulnerabilities and proposed a domestic uranium reserve to reduce the dependence on foreign uranium which is uh, a good first step now the biden administration they took this and they went a little bit further because some of these smr programs they uh, some of these smr designs they required what is called high assay low enriched uranium which basically means uranium uh, enriched up until 20 percent so they basically said, okay, we're going to make sure that this high assay, low enriched uranium can actually be made. And what we also see right now is thanks to mainly uh, the war in Europe, the war in Ukraine, uh, countries, Western countries don't really want to buy a lot of Russian uranium anymore. And this is uh, enriched uranium uh, because Russia is no longer a reliable partner 
But the problem is that Russia almost had 50% of the total uh, uranium enrichment uh, capabilities. So everybody was buying enriched uranium from uh, Russia, including the United States. So what you now see is that both the United States and partners in Europe, they're heavily investing in new enrichment capabilities. I know that Urenco in my country, they are going to increase their enrichment capabilities by a third. And there's also uh, contracts being signed in the United States by Orano. I believe that Urenco also has an as a as a as a deal signed for new enrichment capabilities, which is really needed if we want to wean ourselves off Russian low enriched uranium sales. Now, promoting nuclear exports, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration were. Uh, pretty bullish on this. Uh, so the Trump administration streamlined the export approval process for U.S. technology to compete with Russia and China, supporting the U.S. nuclear co companies globally. And then the Biden administration strengthened nuclear export initiatives through partnerships with companies with countries such as Poland, Sweden, uh, they're in the Philippines, they're in Bulgaria, Ukraine. I mean, this this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there, there's many more countries where there are deals made uh, that 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 will make sure that either you know nuclear components get sold to those countries because they have nuclear power reactors that that use American technology, or where a new AP-1000s are going to get built, like in Poland, for instance, or if everything goes well in Ukraine. So that's, I mean, I think that both Biden and Trump administrations uh, are not bad at this. Then the regulatory streamlining for new nuclear technologies, uh, the Trump administration encouraged the NRC to simplify the licensing process, focusing on faster approval pathways for advanced reactors. And basically, the Biden administration said, OK, we're going to continue uh, on this path um, and we want to emphasize a risk informed uh, framework to facilitate the deployment of new reactor designs. Now, risk informed uh, basically means that you're no longer looking at a, a, you know, a set of rules that you have predetermined. Make sure that everything operates like a light water reactor, for instance, whether that is a boiling water reactor or a pressurized water reactor. Those reactors already have inherently different uh, demands set by the NRC. But if you have a uh, molten salt reactor, or if you have a pebble bat reactor, or if you have a uh, a liquid sodium reactor, those are inherently different than uh, light water reactors. So emphasizing this risk-informed framework, looking at the technology as it is and what it needs to be safe, uh, that's that's a that's a different approach, and 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 I really hope that the NRC uh, can you know manages that can can, can actually uh, facilitate this streamlining process. Then looking at both administrations, uh, nuclear in climate and clean energy pro policies. Now basically, the Trump administration they didn't really. Uh, think that climate change was that big of a problem, so they recognized nuclear as a part of a diverse energy mix, but primarily promoted it for energy security and energy independence, which obviously is something that uh, there, you can say a lot about it, but I do think that it is a sound policy uh, to do. Now, the Biden administration, they integrated nuclear into uh, their clean energy strategy targeting 100% carbon-free electricity by 2035. Now, personally, uh, 2035, um, that, that you, you know, if you, if you make your, your, your end date 2035 and you have to be 100%, then that leaves a lot of nuclear off the table. Because some of these new nuclear power plants, if you start developing an AP1000 project today, Having it operational by 2035 is going to be a very uh, challenging uh, prospect. So, so, so I would say, you know, make sure that you reach 85% and 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 give the the final 15% to nuclear and 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 have nuclear make sure you know that that it can reach that 15% in in you know by 2045, for instance. But whatever we do, we need to make sure that the construction and you know all the the all the the, the stuff that comes 
before it uh, gets expedited. We do, it doesn't have to take four or five or six years to license a construction project, but it also doesn't have to take uh, six or eight years to construct an AP1000. If you can you can make sure that you know the supply chain for all the all the necessary components, and if you can make sure that everybody who knows how to do the civil works, for instance, uh, if if all of those uh, pieces can fall together in the right way, you can construct an AP one thousand in four or five years. That should not be impossible, and and making sure that you have a design that you know a civil works design that that fits the 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 place where you want to build it that doesn't have to take you know that doesn't have to take more than two or three years so in all uh, an ap1000 project from from concept concept until uh, delivering electricity onto the grid shouldn't take more than eight or ten years uh, so so personally i would say 2035 we should be able to build at least six ap1000s for which there are combined licenses at this moment but it's 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 questionable whether everybody really can commit to that. Whether everybody can say, okay, we we are going to do that, and whether you know Westinghouse can make sure that the supply chain will get up to speed, and whether all the people involved can get the necessary uh, training and experience to to basically uh, execute this 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 project uh, as as efficiently and as fat and, and as quickly as humanly possible and the also what 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 the biden administration also did was they spearheaded the effort to triple all nuclear power in the world and they did that at cop 28 that which was uh last uh, last winter so the actual results and this is something that 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 really speaks in biden's um in biden's favor uh, because the trump administration they lost nearly five gigawatts of nuclear power we're talking about the fort calhoun nuclear power plant about oyster creek pilgrim in massachusetts the three mile island uh, nuclear power plant uh, which is now being restarted and they lost one of three indian point uh, reactors when we contrast that with biden then we see a different picture yes they still lost three uh, nuclear power plants indian point unit three palisades unit one and Dwayne arnold but palisades is going to be restarted which is already speaking in their favor. Uh, Vogel three and four, they were started under Biden's, Biden's administration, so not started, but they started delivering electricity onto the grid during Biden's administration. What we see furthermore is the announced, uh, the announced plans for new reactors. We see the TerraPower uh, demonstration reactor that is going to be built in um, Kemmerer, uh, I don't know if I if I can pronounce it, Kemmerer in, in Wyoming. Then you have the demonstration plant for, for Kairos Power in, in Tennessee, in Oak Ridge. And then we have uh, X Power, who are going to build 320 megawatts of Pebble Bat reactors in Washington State, uh, quite close to the Hanford side, uh, which is where Amazon has a lot of their uh, data centers and then there is the announced restarts palisades and three mile island which are definitely big wins for uh, nuclear uh, and, and for the biden administration now let's take a brief look at the map uh, let's see where is it it's over here so this is the map uh, the blue ones those are the new uh, the newly announced uh, projects so we're talking about uh, X Energy, then we have Terra Power over here in Wyoming, and then we have Kairos Power over here in Tennessee. Then this over here is Fort Calhoun, that's one of the closed reactors. Then here we have Oyster Creek, and finally we have Pilgrim. And then I think that there's a shared responsibility for the closure of Indian Point, uh, both the Biden administration and the uh, Trump administration were sleeping at the wheel there. Over here, this uh, this unit was closed during Trump's uh, Trump's administration, but is now getting restarted thanks to the data center deal. And then over here, we have Palisades, where um, Holtec 
uh, basically said, listen, this is a perfectly fine nuclear power plant. There's no reason to uh, to, to demolish it. We can still sell power uh, from this nuclear power plant. So please pay us some money to, to restart it. That's basically how it is going on. Now, we have to give some nuance, and I, I, I've tried to make this clear already in the, in the previous, uh, previous sheets. What you see here, for instance, this is, a, this is a, a, a graphic that I got off the website of TerraPower. Uh, and this here says uh, Clear Path DOE. Uh, this basically gives a, um, a timeline for the ARDP. And, and it and, and it ends with March 2024, where TerraPower submits a construction permit application to the NRC, which is in part thanks to the ARDP. So this whole red uh, piece over here, that's basically everything that happens during the Trump administration. So this is all good work done by the Trump administration. The blue bit over here, that's all good work done by the Biden administration. So, so if we really have to, uh, to, to, we really have to be careful, uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to say who is better or who is worse, because both of them weren't bad on nuclear. They could have been better, especially with the closures. I think that Trump could have done more to to prevent the closures of the nuclear power plants. But in the end, I think that the Biden administration, uh, they took what was good from the Trump administration and they went with it. And, you know, they added on a lot of good stuff for nuclear uh, before the end. So... The trouble here is, and this is this is for me personally, and this is going to cost me likes. This is going to cost me subscribers, but I do have to uh, I do have to talk about this because nuclear energy does not exist in a vacuum, and I do think that there are more important things out there that we need to talk to uh, talk about, and that's why I have to speak my mind. I think that Trump is an absolute threat to the NATO alliance and people who think that NATO has no uh, reason to exist uh, they simply they are blind to the fact that we have a huge problem with dictators and with authoritarian uh, authoritarians in in the world uh, I mean just look at what happens in China look at what happens in North Korea look what happens in Iran uh, look what happens in Russia I mean, these are really, really different, di different, I wouldn't say different. These are really dangerous times that we are living in. And we really need to make sure that the, you know, the, the world, the, the order that we have in the world, which is based on, 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 on the UN charter, which is based on international law, it, 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 it cannot, it cannot fall apart because, but if we, if we, if the if the citizens of the United States elect Trump, this is what is going to happen. He is somebody who who works on on the basis of transactions, right? So he says, okay, if you want something from the United States, and I'm the I'm the boss of the United States currently, then then you need you need to give me something in return, right? So this this transactional. This transactionalism between between Trump and, and and this country and that country, that 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 makes the United States an unreliable partner, and, and this is this is essential if we want to keep Europe alive, for instance. If we don't want to, if we, if if we won't, don't want Europe to fall apart, right? If we don't want to see that uh, that Estonia and Lithuania and, and Latvia are going to be annexed by Russia. That if we don't want to see that happen, then we really need to make sure that, that the NATO alliance stays strong and stays the way it is or becomes even stronger. And we really need to make sure that whatever, whatever agreements that we make with the United States from Europe or from, from other parts of the countries, that, that those are agreements that stand and those are, are, are agreements that are not contingent upon whatever we are going to promise this person, 
And just looking at the whole uh, sordid history uh, of January 6th, the in insurrection, if we look what has happened with the Supreme Court, the fact that uh, the, the, the fact that women have lost the right to basic health care, because if you if you want to have an abortion, I think that it is basic health care, to be honest. And Trump, from a personal perspective, you know, I think that he is unreliable. The transactionalism is, is a major factor there. I think that he is a very nasty, vindictive and petty personality. He's always he's always uh, demeaning other people. He's always uh, calling them names and he's always uh, turning other people into the enemy which is which is which is extremely dangerous especially for somebody who can get carte blanche whenever he can if he gets elected and and the supreme court stays the way it is he can basically do anything he wants he he, he, he can he can damage the freedom of the press he can he can do a lot of damage so so personally i am mortified by the idea that the United States is going to elect uh, Donald Trump. When we contrast Donald Trump with Kamala Harris, I mean, we see a woman who lived in California, basically a lower to middle class lifestyle. Her mother was, you know, paying the bills at the kitchen table. It, it, these are two entirely, completely opposite personalities from each other. And of course, I understand that there are people who are very worried about the border and about immigration and about uh, about the economy. But just look at how it is going now. The United States is not in a bad place economically. Yes, I do agree that inflation is a big problem. But listen, it is a big problem anywhere at this moment. That's just the way it is. If inflation is a problem in Europe, why wouldn't it be a problem in the United States I mean, you don't exist in a vacuum either. And, and that's the point why I'm making this video. Um, I, I think that, that there are more fundamental choices, you know, below the surface. If people who are, you know, energy enthusiasts like me, we tend to, we tend to look at the world and we tend to, you know, factor out all the fluff, all the policy, all the policy, the politics, and we tend to look at it. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm what people call, you know, I'm a technocrat. I think that you can, you can set out to make the world the way that you think that it needs to be. That, that, that's how I think about, you know, technology, about society. But, but that's just not how the world works. And, and the world works a lot differently than, than the way I would like it to work. And, and that's what I want to, what I want to leave you with. So I'm not a US citizen, so it's not my place to tell you who to vote for, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say that I'm afraid of one choice and not afraid of the other. If the people of the United States decide to elect Kamala Harris rather than Donald Trump, then I will I will be relieved. We live in a world where the U.S. has enormous impacts on the socioeconomic stability in other countries, where authoritarianism is on the rise and we need a counterweight in the White House. Otherwise, international order might unravel and... You know, I, I, I realize this, this, you know, I'm really nervous making this video. Uh, people who support Donald Trump, especially those who, uh, who, who believe in Donald Trump, uh, they, they are really going to dislike this video and they might even say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be su subscribed to your channel anymore. And with that, you've made it to the end of this video. I want to thank everybody who made it this far. You know, hear me rambling about U.S. politics. Uh, I want to thank my Patreon supporters in particular because these people enable me to make these kinds of videos. So thank you all for watching. I made a strong force with you. Bye-bye.